Welcome to God of Breath. This is Will Sanchez. Thank you for tuning in. I have a very special guest today. His name is Yannick Benjamin. He is the co-founder of Reeling Forward, which is part of the Access Project. Yannick is a sommelier, and he runs marathons. His last marathon in 2017 was a very interesting marathon. He ran it in a regular wheelchair. So, I'm thrilled to learn all about Yannick. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Yannick, we have a mutual friend, David Liston. Great man. <laughs> he is. When I had him on this, on this TV program, yeah. he had a very interesting story I want to check with you. Yeah. <laughs> he says he knows you because he was at dinner yeah. enjoying wine, enjoying the company of his wife. Of course. And I guess you were there as the, either, I start sommelier. I was I a sommelier, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Yeah. And uh, after you made sure he had two or three wines. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. You approached him and asked him, would he run a marathon in support of Wheeling Forward? That is correct. And did not miss a beat. He said yes right away. He just kind of glazed over to uh, Sarah. And then Sarah just said, well, why not? And he was like, I'm in. And of course, that's typical David. He's uh, one of the most generous human beings and uh, just a true mentor to us all. And it was such an honor to have him, you know, run on behalf of Wheeling Forward. How long ago was that? Probably at least three years ago. No, but that's the first time you met him or you didn't know him before? Uh, no, I met him pretty much. Actually, he was the second guest that I served wine to when I first started at the university club. And I, I started there in June 2013. Um, so it was the second, um, so literally the second customer that I, and I still remember the wine that I served him, uh, Domaine Loire 2008 Bourgogne Blanc. Um, and he was there with, I believe, his cousin. And it was a Sarah, of course. And they were in the tap room and he had this really big beard. But you know, just a great smile, one of the nicest people, really. And I'm so honored to have him as a friend. Wow. The start of a beautiful relationship. Yes, of course. This Absolutely. is New York. This is what it's you all about. You can find love and friendship yeah, yeah, anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> you can for turn sure. the corner. This is what it's oh, all about. But let's introduce you to our audience, yeah. Yannick. Tell us where you were born and something about your growing up years. Yes. I'm born and raised um, in Hell's Kitchen, um, right here in New York City. So, uh, I'm one of the last of the Mohicans, right? Uh, just uh, really was a really great place to grow up at. I mean, obviously growing up um, in the 80s, it was quite interesting. You know, I still, I grew up right down the block uh, from Times Square, right? Um, it was, that was my backyard. So definitely atypical for most people growing up. And I really grew up in a, in a, in a melting pot. You know, my best friends were Hispanic, Puerto Rican, Dominican. Um, and then I had Irish friends, Italian, Jewish friends. So that diversity was definitely there. Um, it kind of molded me. Gave, it was my, uh, that, that formation that made me on who I am today. I'm just kind of always looking outside the box and, and just being colorblind. And so, you know, you'd, we'd have people come over to, to dinner. Both of my parents are French. They, they're both off the boat French. And you could see pictures, and it's just uh, incredible diversity there. But lots of love, lots of loyalty, and I would not trade it um, for anything in this world. Uh, it was just really fantastic. French are known for the love of wine. Is that where it comes from? That's correct. My dad came uh, right after the French-Algerian War. His first job was a dishwasher here in 1963, and he's working for his brother at a local restaurant that's still here on 53rd and um, 5th Avenue called La Grenouille. And he worked there, and then of course he started working other great restaurants, and uh, he really gave me a great um, upbringing, a, a great, and he allowed, it allowed me to do a lot of great things um, because I owe a lot to my mom and my dad. Including the, the love of wine, and where you became more than just a yeah. drinking wine, you became an expert on how to, uh, <laughs> to serve it and, and how to help customers <laughs> buy the, the right wines. Yeah. So, did you uh, go on to college? Right after high school, I went to uh, Baruch College. And prior to that, I was already working in restaurants, and that was my love. By the age of 13 years old, I had made a firm decision that that's what I wanted to do, was work in restaurants. I wanted to be around wine. I wanted to be around food. But I wanted to be around people. That's what I love. I love just doing this. I love talking, understanding. I'm a very curious person, so I always love to learn something new. Okay. And people can offer that. And so I went to Baruch College. And of course, my focus was more on, on, on work than it was um, in school. And then eventually, my grades were not great. And my dad said, OK, well, you're coming with me. We're going to get you a great restaurant job. And at the age of 18, I started working at Le Cirque 2000, which was at the Palace Hotel. So it was a, an amazing experience. Um, and I stayed there for a couple of years. And then I moved around. I worked at John George and Oceana and Felidia. And 
working in restaurants and moving my way up, you know, busboy bus to, boy, yeah, to a porter, to whatever it was, you know, and I was just there to learn as much as I can. And then I started working as a sommelier. My first sommelier job was at Felidia. And I started working there and it was such an incredible experience opening up all these beautiful Italian wines. And then I started working at the Ritz Carlton Hotel on Central Park South. And then I, and then that's when it really opened up the avenue for like uh, greatness. Okay, you need training for that, right? You just can't declare yourself to be a wine expert. Right. It, you probably need uh, some kind of schooling, a certificate or something. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great sommeliers that I know that have never gone to school because you can really kind of do it on your own, self-taught, just based on the experience. But there are a lot of great educational or schools that you can do, programs, um, the Court of Master Sommelier, the International Wine Center. How did you do it? I, went, I started taking wine classes at the age of 18. I was underaged. Um, so I was, I was, but that was my passion. That's what I love to do. And it wasn't just about drinking the wine itself. It's what that wine glass had to offer. It was just the geography, the geology of it all, the microclimate, um, the vintages, the, the struggle of man and woman versus vine, the, the struggle of the vine itself. So that's uh -huh. what I really loved about it, the historical backgrounds of it. Uh -huh. And that's what really got me into it. You know, that's what I loved. Wow. <laughs> You make it sound like a very good profession to go into. I absolutely love it. I love wine and I love the hospitality industry. Okay. Are there different degrees of uh, wine experts? There are two different institutions, but Master Sommelier and then Master of Wine are the two highest levels you can do. And you can also do sommelier competitions as well. And that's what I did. I, I did a lot of sommelier competitions and it's something that I really enjoyed. I did very well on some of them and I did poorly on some, but I always learned something new about myself. Oh, interesting. Sort of like an iron chef for, for wine. Yeah, well, pretty fact, much. Yeah. In fact, I think you do a show now called Uncork. There was a show on, uh, that I did a couple of years ago called Uncork. That's correct. Yeah. It was, it was definitely, um, it, it, it was following six of us, uh, six sommeliers who are trying to go for the um, the highest level, which was the master sommelier examination. And um, during that, during the show, they, we would do competitions and all that kind of stuff, yeah. And so what's a competition like in wine? Able yeah. to tell where this wine came from down to its yeah, essentials? You've got to strip it down. So you, usually they'll give you six wines and each wine you've got to dissect, right? So you've got to talk about the, the flavor in it. Does it have oak, no oak? What type of soil was it grown on? Uh, what region is it from? You know, uh, what vintage? I mean, what type of grapes? Or if it's just one grape? So very, very specific. You have to talk about it. My gosh, so how do you learn those things? It's just like anything else. It's like running. It's like working out. Um, you've got to practice, practice, practice. Surround yourself with people who are going to challenge you. You know, a lot of reading, a lot of research, um, lots of money spent on bottles of wine. <laughs> but that's what it really is, to tell you the truth. <laughs> it's a very expensive, yeah. I mean, I spent close to like 15000 yearly when I was taking the uh, competitions and the exams from like traveling to meet up with other professionals to visiting region, regions, okay. uh, buying bottles. So it, it, it's a big investment, absolutely. Now, during that time, what was your physical activity? Were you, were you going to the gym? Were you running? Since I was a kid, I was a big athlete and I remained a big athlete. Um, so I, I, ice hockey was my sport. Uh, I absolutely adore it. It was like a passion of mine. And then I would play a lot of basketball for sure. Um, just watching, I love soccer. But then as I got older and you know, I was working a lot, but I, I was a fanatic uh, at the gym. I was, okay. I, I mean, I would go to 24 hour gyms. I would finish work at midnight and there used to be a gym called uh, Johnny Latz on 17th Street. It's no longer there yeah. uh, in the flower district. And that's where I would go um, to work out after work. I mean, it was pretty insane how okay. dedicated I was. <laughs> All right. But something happened in 2003. was that's a correct. very pivotal year in your life. That's correct, yes. I believe you got married. I did, yeah. And then, well, yeah. tell us, tell us yeah, about so that. Yeah, so in October uh, 27, uh, sorry, October 27, 2003, I was in a car accident um, that left me permanently paralyzed. It happened um, on the West Side Highway here in New York City. And I knew right then and there when it happened, believe it or not, when, I, when it kind of just calmed down, that whatever happened to me at that moment was going to have some serious permanent effects. Um, so I already at that moment, believe it or not, I was already preparing. I was already kind of um, stimulating my brain with like accepting that something in my body was going to change. So you never lost consciousness? I never lost consciousness. Which airbags helped at all? No, I mean, um, unfortunately, you know, um, I think what it was, it was what they call a burst fracture, you know, so from the landing. Um, and then, you know, there's real no scientific, no one knows for sure exactly how it happened. Um, there was no airbag that really came out, unfortunately, um, but it, it was pretty impactful.
I was driving. Unfortunately, I was driving by myself. Um, so it's something that I'm very grateful for because who knows what could have happened to the other person. And so, you know, being able to move on with my life makes it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Sure, it's not an easy situation. I know. But if something would have happened to that other person, I that know. would have been... You would have been guilty. It would have been very complicated. All right. Here you are, newlywed. Yeah. The whole family must have been devastated. I mean, glad you were going to yeah. make it. Right. So did that affect your marriage? You know, I have to say we're no longer together, but we have remained friends. And like I always tell people who are newly injured, just remember, you're not the only one who's injured. Everybody else who's around you is injured. So that's something to keep in mind. And it certainly was not an easy situation. We were both very young. We were both uh, 25 years old when it happened. And this day, day of age to be married that young, you know, uh, it's a lot to yeah. deal with. Yeah. But she was a total trooper, um, never blinked an eye and just kind of went for it. I mean, I owe a lot to her. I'm, I'm indebted to her. I have a lot of gratitude towards not just her, but her family as well, who I remain in touch with. And some of the nicest people. I mean, this mm -hmm. really just great. And I'm very, very lucky. Very, very lucky. It's, it's uh, strange to hear that when you're sitting in a wheelchair. Yeah, no, it's Because true. a lot of people would give up. Yeah. But you had the support of your family. Absolutely. And obviously you made new friends because right. you, know, you had to now figure out a new world. That's true. It was eye-opening to be in rehabilitation and to see the amount of support, the amount of love that I was receiving. And then when I saw the other patients on the same floor and they would not get that, to me, it just made me feel so grateful for what I had um, or for what I have um, just in general, because not a lot of people get that. And so it was up to now, I'm, uh, I'm so fortunate. I'm so blessed. Well, that's great to hear and yeah. that's very inspiring. No, thank you. But then after you figure out, you know, they say take care of yourself first before you start helping others. Yeah, that's true. So you figured out your situation the best you could, and then you founded the Access Project. Right. Tell yeah. us about that. So, right. So uh, it's Willing Forward is a 501c3. And where this idea and where the concept of a Willing Forward comes from was started along with the president and co-founder, Alex Olagudin, who I met because we were both roommates. We were in two separate car accidents, but we were roommates in the same rehabilitation center for uh, over four months. So we developed a very strong bond. And he himself as well has an incredible uh, family and a network of friends and support and love. And we both came to the realization like, hey man, like why, why is this happening to us? But the same people over there are not having that same kind of love and support. It bothered us a little bit. So of course he went back to school, went on to become a lawyer, I went back to school myself, finished my college degree as well, but started working right away. And I had a couple of like uh, obstacles. I got a pressure sore, I got a really bad infection on my leg. So it wasn't really until 2009 that things started to really come full circle in a positive way, right? So About 2012, we finally decided to do the paperwork, became a 501c3, and we became Wheeling Ford. But our goal and our initiative was very simple quality of life, to help those that, you know, simple modifications. If you need to have the doors wide and open, we're there to try to help you. Any kind of advocacy, um, some kind of, you're facing discrimination, we're there to help you. But most of all, to really be your family, to be your friend, to be your network of support, love, and care. That's what we wanted to be. And what I really wanted to also implement was my years of hospitality, my love and passion for hospitality. And, and what we call ourselves is we're a hospitality-driven nonprofit. And so I tell everyone that works at Willing Ford, you never say no. We're solutions oriented. We figure it out. If a member needs something, we don't say no. Let's just figure it out. That's interesting. I saw a video, which was filmed like an episode where it looked like you were working at a help desk. You got the phone call. Right. When you call the right people, we're going to come and help you right now. I got the tube and I'm going to fix it for you. What else do you need? A bottle of Christian Marola Club 2014 Chablis because you love it so much. Not a problem, bringing that to you right now. predicted the, um, the elevator is actually broken, was not reported to the uh, website. Um, so now I just have to figure out another solution. Now I'm gonna show you what I typically do, do when this happens. Ariane, you're getting that bottle of wine. Most importantly, you're getting that tube. We're fixing that tire. Go wheeling forward. Hey,
most important thing when you go down a flight of stairs is to always make sure you're dressed up properly with a nice suit, nice orange socks, and uh, some uh, nicely unpolished shoes. So let's go back. The purpose of the episode was right. to show how difficult it is to get right. from one side of town to right. the other because your favorite subway station near Yankee Stadium, <laughs> the elevator wasn't working. Yeah. And you turn around and it was it was eye opening that you just popped right down those steps when your wheelchair. Yeah, I mean I'm my mom's not gonna be too happy to hear that I still do that. <laughs> but uh, you know, you have to do it because how many times can you tell your boss? Sorry, I'm going to be late because the elevator is broke, right? So it just kind of goes back to being solutions oriented, to thinking outside the box. But it is a very frustrating situation because there's very few people that are in wheelchairs that can do it. I mean, if you're in a motorized wheelchair, a power oh, wheelchair, yeah. there's no, no way, way you're going no. to be in... Those things weigh a ton. ton. And, and these are the challenges that people with disabilities are facing. Um, so there's a lack of, um, of kind of a progressive thinking in the MTA and it's something that I'm that I've kind of taken on, and I'm making a, a passion project for myself to say, this is enough. We have to think outside the box, and, and that's what I'm trying to do. I was just at a board meeting a few days ago at the MTA headquarters down on Two Broadway, protested, and also spoke in front of the board. And hopefully, change can happen. We'll see what happens. You know, they just finished the Second Avenue subway, right? And we spent like four billion dollars, and yeah. I think we got four stations out of it. Yeah. Three new ones and one rehabilitated, right? And darn it, the elevators on the 86th Street station I know. breaks down. I don't understand it. No one understands it. It's a phenomenon in itself why these elevators are constantly breaking. The maintenance of it is very poor. But it's, you know, it's just, we have to take, you know, accountability as a public. There are people who abuse the elevators, who take them, who should not be taking them. I mean, I today I saw 15 people pack themselves in like sardines in elevators. So... You know, the, the lack of respect that we have for um, for certain things that, that are on the public, you know, it's something that we need to rethink about. Um, and we say, you know, people throwing gum on, on the floor, um, polluting garbage. Yeah, yeah. These are things that we really have to think about as yeah. well. It's a never ending issue. Yeah, for sure. Now, a few years ago, one of our local assembly member wanted, I think what was, yes, when Bloomberg was mayor, right. he wanted to, new, because they were going to give a new a contract for the new cabs. Oh, yes. <laughs> and he said, let's make sure to take this opportunity, right. not only to make the cabs as green as possible, right. but wheelchair Chair accessible. accessible yeah. But I don't think it happened. Alex Elagudin, who's the president of William Ford, he actually works for the TLC, and he's done a tremendous job to, as far as bringing awareness for the conversions of more wheelchair accessible taxis. We had a great hearing about three weeks ago downtown. I'm in front of the board about that. And things are slowly changing, but they're changing. And that's what's great. Right now, the fight right now is for Uber to have more accessible cabs as well. Being a late person, well, yeah. wait a minute. Bloomberg, back in Bloomberg, you know, right. you had a local official, Micah Kellner. He, he was fighting for cabs because they were going to give a contract to right. build the new cabs. Right. And somehow the, the company that was going to right. 100 percent right. wheelchair accessible didn't happen. So this is nothing new. It's nothing new, but I, I, I do feel very positive about this, about the TLC and, where, and the direction that they're going towards. And hopefully Uber and Lyft and all these other big um, companies will follow suit. I think the yellow cab should have been leaders on this. And, well, <laughs> now they're facing challenges from these companies like Uber, you know, they got a, yeah, oh, yeah. They got a way, you know, just use your smartphone to get that, that cab. Absolutely. Okay. I took training in emergency preparedness. Okay. And one of the issues came about make sure that your family's well taken care of in terms of, you mm -hmm. know, they got food, they got, a, they know how to find you before you rush right. out and help other people. Right. You know, same thing, you know, you're helping in your life. You of know, course. Make sure your situation is taken of care of. Of course. And one of the things that, that comes up is the handicapped. I said, oh, cool. You know, the emergency preparedness actually thinks about the handicapped because when a disaster comes, but what we were trained was to make sure that, mm -hmm. you know, there's only so much we can do. So we concentrate sure. in our building. Of so I live in a condo. Right. So I work with my neighbors that's to, great. you know, make sure we know each other to some extent so that where there's I an emergency, fabulous, we know yeah. there's going to be lights in the stairways. So also, if there's anybody in the building that's, you know, on oxygen or is in a wheelchair, right. that they have a buddy, either somebody in the building or somebody yeah. 
you know, outside of the building that will check up sure, on you. Sure. Now, do you have a, a buddy in case of an emergency? No, which just gave me something to think about. I have my wife, but uh, Heidi, but uh, that's my buddy. But no, it's something that you know just gave me something to think about because I live in a cult myself, and our next meeting is on December 10th, so it's definitely something that I will definitely bring up, I promise you. And I'll make sure uh, Mr. Sanchez gets the credit for it. <laughs> you don't, I don't need the credit because uh, it's a, it was a program that uh, New York City does. At the time, it was called All Together Now. Okay. And it was, it was geared for buildings, to make the buildings right. self-sufficient. Oh, great. But that program has morphed into Ready New York. You probably okay. hear that every September, people go out. And, Are you a Ready New Yorker? You know? Yeah, no, no. I think that's a great idea, for sure. Okay. Fantastic. At some point, you discovered you have this this talent for racing in your yeah. wheelchair. Yeah. Now, you did that for fun at the begin with? What really happened was, I think my first New York City marathon was in 08. And I just was pushing left and right all over the place. And I was working out. I felt in, in really good shape. And I said, you know what? I want to do the New York City marathon. And however, I want to do my first one in my regular chair. And uh, it was a lot of training, a lot of work. And I knew that the New York City Marathon course was quite challenging with the bridges and some hills and all that, but I wasn't expecting it to be that difficult, especially. But I, I finished in five hours. It was really an, an enormous accomplishment for me. I was very proud of that moment, very emotional. And the reason why it was emotional, because I remember specifically being in bed, 2003, the night of my accident, and the doctor came in, it was just me and my mom. And at this point, I really couldn't talk so much. I, you know, just obviously you can only imagine. And so the doctor came in very eager almost to tell me this bad news. That is, he had this big grin on him and he said, Yannick Benjamin, you're a good looking guy. You seem strong, but chances of you ever doing a marathon is never going to happen. So he was basically telling me that I would never walk again, right? And I'm just looking at him. I wanted to scream and say, why would you say it this way in front of my mom? I mean, I knew that I was going to get over it. But that always stuck with me, actually. It always stuck with me. So when I crossed that finish line, I wish I would have gotten that doctor's name because I would have, like, written him a nice little note and said, well, I did it, you know, and he actually motivated me to do it. Wow. But it also upset me because, you know, the lack of etiquette and lack of, lack, lack of hospitality for that was not there. I mean, all, empathy. Empathy, no empathy, no empathy. I mean, but this is something that exists in a lot of different fields. And it's really kind of, it shocks me, it saddens me. But I think, you know, if we can retrain ourselves and, and, and grow culturally together and change that, I think we can, we can make it happen. Okay. Why in a regular wheelchair? So I have a racing chair. I do compete in a racing chair. You know, you go significantly faster. And I got a brand new, beautiful Eagle sports chair. I flew down to Atlanta, got specked out for it, and I was super excited to use my new Eagle racing chair at the marathon. I got a, an email from my friend Eric Kondo, who's a paraplegic, one of the most amazing men you'll ever meet. And he said, Yannick, did you see what they posted on the New York City Marathon website? There's a picture of a racing wheelchair saying that this is the only type of wheelchair that you can use for the New York City Marathon. And that just lit a fire under me because I said, well, how dare they? Because for me, I found that to be a form of financial discrimination. Only 15 to 20 percent of people with disabilities actually work, are actually financially independent, actually have family that can actually help them fly to Atlanta, you know, get a new wheelchair. I mean, that, that's a $10,000 investment that I'm making into that racing wheelchair. Now, you find me, any, any people with this, any, someone with a disability that can afford to do that. It's very small. Yeah. So, you know, to call yourself a marathon of inclusion, that to me is not inclusion, okay? To say that being in a regular chair is more dangerous than being in a racing chair, that's shocking. That's not true at all because racing chair, you go significantly faster. So it's not. It's um, very streamlined. Have you seen it? Yeah, right? exactly. It's, it's, I mean, you go faster. You, you, it's a, you, you know, you're practically yeah. horizontal. That was why I did it. And I, wanted, I was hoping that, you know, so me and Eric, we were both on the course. And I was hoping that they were going to pull me over and say, you cannot get to the finish line. Now, I got some dirty looks, for sure, but no one stopped me. But I bet the New Yorkers along the way were cheering you on. Spectators yeah. and all that, they're unbelievable. Mm -hmm. The love I and mean, the support, oh, they're great. It's the best so, part of the marathon. But did they change the policy after that? Uh, not yet, but it's definitely that I'm, I'm, you better believe it's something that I'm working on right now. Because you did it again this past year. Yeah, exactly. That's why I did it. You know, you did it the first time and you did it last time. Yep, exactly. I mean, actually, I've done it on three different occasions. I'm a regular chair. They have not changed the policy. They, 
against their wives, not to challenge you. I'm going to challenge them, that's for sure. And I, I think what they're doing is great. I think the, the marathon itself is great. I know it's a lot of work, a lot of coordination, and they have my, all my respect. Yep, yep. But they need to be able to listen to voices like myself. That's right. I think they will. You know, they have a lot on their plate. Yeah. And uh, they do a lot of great work. I know them 100%, pretty well. 100%, yeah. I think talk to the right people, it, it will happen. I want to cover... Yeah. The Access Project, which yep. is this wellness center that you have right. in Manhattan. Yep. It's really a gym for people with disabilities, with physical disabilities. Right. Co-founded along with uh, George Gallego and Alex Lagunin. Uh, George Gallego is a paraplegic who's also, who still is a, tri a triathlon, so amazing athlete. And this concept is a very simple concept. Having a, a, a facility for people with disabilities, all types of disabilities, to be able to go work out there all the equipment is adaptive. The trainers there know how to deal with you. They can help you. They can assist you. And you can get a workout because this is what's so important to keep that body in shape, to keep it going. That's what's going to keep you going for a long time. And it's the only one in the city? Maybe the only one in the state. I don't know about the, the nation. I'm not going to say that. But we're located on 1325 Fifth Avenue. And if you're interested, just stop by. Pop by. Say hello. If you want to volunteer, please. We'll, we'll love, we'd love it. Is that uh, city supported or government supported? Or how do you... Yeah, we, I mean, most of it is from fundraising from the wine tastings that I do and then we do get some support some you know grants obviously and and, and all that some really oh, wonderful grants okay. so when David Liston runs the marathon it does help he wears the NYPD shirt but he's also fundraising for you guys he's been doing a lot of great work for us recently you I think you had six team members we each did. one had a goal with 3,000 and yeah. All of you beat the 3,000. Yeah, we had a... And you led with 7,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a very successful year of fundraising for, um, due to the New York City Marathon. Great, great. Now, what's some of your future chances? So professionally, are you going to be going for that master's? I still flirt with the idea of going back with it, for sure. But I, I think definitely it's something probably long-term that I'd like to try to do again. I feel ready for it. I feel good about it. I feel settled in my life. And then continually to grow with both myself, um, with my wife. Really, she's my best friend, Heidi Turzen. And so just kind of traveling the world, just learning and, and just kind of never losing that curiosity. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then athletically, is there an event that you're looking forward to? Listen, this was my eighth New York City Marathon. My goal is to do 10 at least. I'll definitely be doing it on my racing chair. No more. I'm retiring from the regular chair and keeping in shape and keeping these love handles off. You know, that's not an easy thing when you're drinking a lot of wine and good food. <laughs> okay. I'm sure you can lift a, a ton. Maybe not like a few years ago, but I can still lift. <laughs> you can still lift. So now that lifting note. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming in. Oh, thank you so much. What a pleasure.